produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. Quick note before we start our show, if you're afraid of heights, you should probably listen to this episode, but you should know we are about to talk about jumping off of things. If you are having distressing thoughts, you should call 1-800-273-TALK. Anonymous and open 24-7. Get some help if you need it. Okay, let's go. Emery, this is your favorite kind of place. We went to your favorite kind of place, <laughs> the top of a very tall building. This is, this is my least favorite moment of working with you so far. <laughs> I can honestly say that. And that's saying something. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, we're on top of the building right now on the rooftop, right next to the railing above a highway. 10 Buick Street. Um, in Boston, right across from our office. Uh, uh, why are we here, though? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know, but why we had to do this, I'm not entirely sure. We had to, though. We had to go to the top of one of the tallest buildings in Boston, 10 Buick Street. Okay, maybe not the tallest building in Boston or even close, but it's like the tallest building we could sneak onto the roof of and be relatively sure we're not going to get arrested because a fine gentleman has led us up here. Um, and also, we're, we're testing a theory of fear and fearlessness. Mostly of fear, in my case. <laughs> It's actually a phenomenon, a phenomenon that half of the world's population supposedly feels in their gut when they're in a place like this. All right, Amory, get as close as you can to the edge. Come on, you can do it. Let's I'm all, look over. I'm at the edge. Let's look over a little bit. Let's just see if we I can I might see. need to crouch down a little bit. I'm okay. not kidding. Okay, that's fine. If I can, like, push Do whatever my... is comfortable. I mean, as uncomfortable as you are, do whatever is comfortable. This is the worst. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you feel in your gut right now when you look over? Look over again and tell me what you feel. I can just visualize myself falling to my death. How you doing over there? <laughs> so I have that too, but I have this other feeling. Um, and it's really weird. It's kind of a weightlessness. I can almost describe it as like, I feel like the bottoms of my feet feel tickly and like they could come off of the top of the building really easily. And also I kind of hear a voice whispering something. It's telling me to jump. There's a name for it. It's also the name of our episode. Emery, I'm gonna to count to three. Okay. One, two, three. Call of the Void! I'm Ben Brock Johnson, and this is Endless Thread, a show featuring stories found in the vast ecosystem of online communities called Reddit. I'm here with my co-host, Amory Sievertson, and we are coming to you from WBUR, Boston's NPR station. So this is a thing that apparently a lot of people feel, and most people don't really talk about it, except some people do on Reddit. There are actually several threads that discuss this feeling that is unofficially referred to as the call of the void, or l'appel du vide in French, where it was coined first. And we're going to get to what exactly that means and why it's called that. But first, we've got to get to a spot that is firmly on solid ground and occupied by a Redditor named Swantia. I am on my couch, which is located in Germany. She's 25 years old, she's a single mom, and she's a student, finishing her education, something that was slowed down when she had her daughter. About a year ago, Swantia was going through treatment for ADHD and depression, which she's pretty upfront about. She was in a small town in Germany getting that treatment, and the town had some abandoned hospitals in it. Swanti and some of the friends she'd made in town were into exploring some of these abandoned hospitals because, I guess, unlike some of us, exploring an abandoned hospital isn't something that sounds terrifying. And one of these hospitals had these two towers. Each one was 10 stories tall. Swanti and her friends were hanging out on the rooftop of one of those towers. My mom always said I was a really hard kid to watch because I would always be around climbing on stuff. Pushing the limits. Yeah. Swantia found herself kind of staring across the gap between the two towers. I'm not really good at distances, but they are quite some gap 
away from each other. Um, I'm not one for jumping, actually, not really. So I, I like to climb high, but I don't like to jump over height at all. And I'm not like to be near, near an edge. So it might have been that I felt very sporty during that time and very fit. I don't know, whatever pushed me there, but um, I just ran and jumped. And while I was jumping, I was totally like blanked out. And when I landed, I was still blanked out, except for, oh shit, what have you done? And then I yeah, went like really shivering and ice cold sweat all over me. <sighs> yeah, that was a weird feeling, definitely. Like um, not being in control, that was a very impulsive thing to do. This is maybe a strange question, but were you sober at the time? Yes. Yes, I had to be sober to um, go to therapy, yeah. Mm. Why do you think you did this? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm um, not surprised about that, actually, because I do have some poor impulse control sometimes. <laughs> um, I think it might have been something like... Um, you, you know that little voice you sometimes have that dares you to try your own borders? Like yes. to go. Yeah, that kind of stuff. And it's really quiet, but it's very powerful. And I think that was what happened. What, were you already a mother at this time when you made this jump? Yeah, yeah. That's why I was so angry with me, too. I mm. was. And yeah, that's not really cool to do if you have a kid. It's not cool at all. How old is your daughter? She's six now, freshly turned oh. six. Is she a thrill seeker as well? No, no, <laughs> thankfully not. <laughs> no, she's really, really calm. She's totally like my sister, actually, which is good. Totally leveled out, very responsible. Not at all like me. <laughs> Swantia says she's better at impulse control now, thanks to therapy. She keeps a diary, and that helps too. Her story is pretty unique, though. At least, it's unusual to find someone who gave into this impulsive, intrusive thought and lived to talk about it. It still doesn't answer the question of why people have this voice in their heads, though. But she knows she's far from the only one to have this little voice whispering to her. And that's okay. If we talk about some evil aspects or bad aspects or morally not acceptable aspects that are inside of us, we open ourselves to the possibility of talking about stuff that's going on between us so we could help people who would like to act on these thoughts instead of shutting them out socially. So we actually found several examples of people having these thoughts on Reddit. Another one we found was this next comment. The person who commented didn't really want to talk, but they told us we could read the comment. This is from user Extremely Correct. I stood on a rocky mountainside next to the ocean once. Below were more rocks and waves splashing over them. I felt an extreme urge to jump down. I have never felt such a strong urge before. It literally felt like the devil was sitting on my shoulder, whispering in my ear to jump. The devil sitting on my shoulder, whispering in my ear to jump. It's a pretty intense image. I know, right? But it's there, this devil voice, this pull, when you're in a high place. Or maybe it's a push, something drawing you to the edge. And even if it's not something a lot of people talk about, if you look closely, the examples are there, like in movies. Not the kind of movie you might expect, like a documentary or Vertigo or something, but the kind of movie featuring Johnny Depp playing Keith Richards playing a pirate. You know that feeling you get sometimes when you're standing in a high place? Sudden urge to jump? I don't have it. Captain Jack is like me. He doesn't have the urge to jump. True. And Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides was, strangely enough, mentioned in a scientific study, the only scientific study looking at this phenomenon, the call of the void. Yep, we've got a scientific study and a real scientist. Science in a minute.
Okay, so we've established that, at least anecdotally, this devil in your ear when you're in a high place, this urge to jump, this call of the void, if you will, it's a thing. Right, but you don't have to take it from us. Take it from April. Hello, this is April. April Smith is an associate professor of psychology at Miami University, which is in Ohio. And I teach and do research on eating disorders and suicidal behavior. And back in 2011, April co-authored a study. It's called An Urge to Jump Affirms the Urge to Live, an Empirical Examination of the High Place Phenomenon. And April says that this study came about in kind of an unusual way. I imagine this is how scientists always do science, like they're sitting around measuring the circumference of a human skull or like <laughs> looking in a Petri dish and thinking about aliens or something. And one of them says like, hey, Terry, or like, hey, Tiffany, you ever think about X? This is a very good example of why you are not a scientist. <laughs> OK, fair. But this is actually how April says this particular study came about. Vindicated. It's, yep, it's the exception to the rule, in a way. A bunch of graduate students got talking. And we were in a lab that studied suicidal behavior. And we thought this was weird because we ourselves weren't suicidal. But several of us could actually relate to this. You know, oh, yeah, I've you know been on a bridge and felt like I wanted to jump. And that was so odd. What was going on with that? And so it really kind of started out as just sort of a workplace conversation. Uh, But being scientists, you know, we actually thought, well, you know, we could actually kind of study this and see, you know, is this a phenomenon that does exist more broadly? And is it the case that mostly suicidal people have this urge? Or might it be that people who aren't suicidal can still have these kind of weird thoughts about jumping? Talk to me about the other name for this, Call of the Void. What's the difference there? That would probably be more of the kind of term of art in maybe fiction or uh, literature. Uh, You know, it it does sound perhaps more romantic. Okay. All right. Fair enough. The 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 call of the void is for um, is for plebes like me, and uh, yep, (laughs) high place phenomenon is for for a little bit more empirical sounding. Sure. So April and her co-authors came up with an online survey for undergrad students. They were looking for 400 responses. That would give them a large enough sample of people that would include a few from the supposed 10 to 12 percent of people who have considered suicide. But also, people who have felt call of the void or high place phenomenon, but hadn't ever considered suicide. They needed 400. They got 431. So the first uh, big takeaway uh, was kind of a confirmation that people do have these thoughts. This is a thing. Yeah, this a is a thing. thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, basically, um, depending on, you know, kind of who you're asking or what question you're asking, you know, close to 50 percent of people have experienced this. This is the 50 percent number we keep mentioning. And this is surprisingly high, but it bears out. Then when you and I were on the rooftop, one of us felt it, the other one didn't. Right. But one of the other goals of the study was to figure out why this is a thing. Like, what is happening in the human psyche that supposedly makes half of the population think about or imagine themselves jumping? April says it's about different parts of the brain. We basically have different ways of processing information. And so there are some systems that are super fast. They're operating at the level of basic automaticity. Um, They're kind of outside of our conscious control. But then, of course, we also have more deliberative ways of processing information. You know, Mm. for example, what you're going to eat for lunch, that kind of thing. Okay. And so it could be the case that when you're up somewhere high, your brain is basically sending an alarm signal, uh, you know, hey, be careful, And that could actually lead you to take a step back or, you know, kind of notice your surroundings. And then that more deliberative process kind of kicks in and you start to think, you know, why did I just take a step back? I'm, you know, totally fine. There's no reason for me to be afraid. Oh, I must have wanted to jump. That's so interesting. It's like a conversation that you're having with yourself. Yep. Are you basically saying that you don't actually have the thought, I should jump? It's like a trick of the mind somehow? Among people who aren't suicidal, yes. It's kind of this post hoc rationalization of a behavior or a noticing of your surroundings. Okay. 
I love this. You know, you would love this. As someone who feels the urge. No, but this explanation is so cool. The idea that basically in this split second, when you're in this high place, two parts of your brain are trying to have a conversation and you're sort of like misinterpreting the conversation. Your biological computer is like glitching out, trying to reconcile these two separate ideas. I'm fine, but I'm close to not being fine, which must mean I want to not be fine. Maybe I want to jump. That's fascinating. The study also goes against what April says are some common myths about suicide. There's this misperception that sometimes suicide is engaged in impulsively, uh, so that somebody might just have the thought to kill themselves and act on it. And at least from the research that I'm aware of and that our lab has conducted, that's really not supported. Um, What we know is that typically people have often thought about uh, their suicides um, in advance, if not hours, often days, weeks, even years in advance. Okay, so this call of the void isn't directly connected to suicide, which is often more premeditated than this feeling, which is more instinctual. But do these non-suicidal thoughts about jumping tell us anything bigger about ourselves? It does in the sense that we all have weird idiosyncratic thoughts, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that, you know, we have death wishes or, um, you know, there's something uh, murderous or wrong. You know, it could just be the case that you know, our brains are processing information so quickly. And, you know, when it rises to the level of an alarm, then we start to try to interpret, like, what was going on? We don't necessarily need to take all of our thoughts, um, actually, as true, which is weird. So a certain percentage of our thoughts, it's good to remember, are just like... Just chatter, static, yeah. Yeah, static, yeah. That's a great description. Yeah. Huh. So the call of the void, high place phenomenon, devil voice, whatever you want to call it, it's part of this static. And there's a whole genre of thoughts like this, called intrusive thoughts, a lot of which have nothing to do with high places. These could be thoughts like you're driving down the road and you think about hitting a pedestrian or you're washing your child and you think about causing harm to your child. Or you might think about harm coming to a partner or spouse. You know, they get in a car crash or they get in a plane accident. So they're intrusive, they're uncomfortable. And most people actually um, have had an experience where they've had some kind of intrusive thought like that. I totally get these. Like, I want to scream something crazy in the middle of a recital or something or do something incredibly violent. I get these. I get these too. And sometimes they are definitely violent. Yeah, like you just told me the other day that you get stabby. I do. I get a little stabby. Not actually stabby, just mentally stabby. $200,000, are you mad? I don't get mad. I get stabby. The Simpsons, man. They just get me. Congratulations, but we did find a Redditor who also totally gets these violent feelings. My name is Justin. I live in Denver. Justin's experience matches April's description of these more general intrusive thoughts. They sort of drift in like a wave. So they're kind of disturbing thoughts, not not in a way that I feel scared or uncomfortable or it doesn't make me question myself. It's never an urge to act on any thought, but it's an urge to do... It's almost an, a feeling of thinking about the worst-case scenario in a situation. What it would feel like to be in a van that's rolling down the side of a cliff. Um, what it would feel like to drive in oncoming traffic, and they're disturbing thoughts, but it never disturbed me to have them. Because I thought in some way maybe it was just healthy to think about and prepare yourself for an awful situation. The darkest of these thoughts started about three years ago when Justin became a dad. And just a heads up, this is upsetting. And that is why it's important to play this next bit, because we're talking about things that we're afraid to talk about, thoughts we usually don't admit that we have, even if we'd never act on them. So the most disturbing, and one that's probably the hardest to talk about, are the the thoughts that I've had with my son, And the reason it 
I mentioned that it happens a lot when we're cooking or in the kitchen. Is sometimes if I'm cutting vegetables with a knife and he's standing on a stool, you know, helping the best he can, um, I'll think about things about how it might feel to stab him, um, which is a really disturbing thought. I would obviously never stab my son the same as I would never jump off a building or drive my van off a cliff, but it's somehow, it's like the thought just wandered in and I'm like, oh, that's pretty messed up. Maybe it's like 30 seconds I'll spend on the thought of like how he would feel. And then I kind of think, oh, how would it feel to get, if I got stabbed? And then I'm just like back to cutting carrots. <laughs> and and the thought just kind of drifts away. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but I have heard many parents talk about those same sort of thoughts. Now, if you're thinking, wait, call child services, take a step back from the edge, because again, these thoughts are common. Justin's not planning on doing this. He's just picturing it. And this goes back a bit to April's point that some thoughts, well, they're just brain static. And it's important to remember that because the real danger here might be more about how we feel about ourselves for just having these intrusive thoughts. Where we can see it becomes problematic is if they start to think, well, you know, because I had the thought, that's basically the same as doing it. Or, you know, because I had the thought, that that must mean uh, that I want to do it, or there's something wrong about me that I'm that I'm having these thoughts in the first place, or you know, gosh, that was a really upsetting thought. Now I really need to not think about it, and then of course they think about it more. April hopes there's more study of these ideas, but for now she's just glad to have proven to a reasonable degree that she's not the only one with high place phenomenon. Call of the void. Whatever you want to call it. Can we talk about one more example, though, the funny one? You're talking about the Reddit user with the paper? That's right. Didn't want to talk to us because they said they're shy, but they were cool with us including their story. Posted on the same thread as the German woman, Swantia, in the Ask Reddit community. The question was, people who have succumbed to the call of the void, what happened? And this person writes, I was once sitting in my eighth grade math class while we were working on a worksheet and was driven to eat my desk partner's paper. Without second thought, I ripped off a quarter of their paper and ate it. It didn't taste good, but it felt kind of liberating. Everyone laughed it off, so I wasn't too embarrassed. I've not eaten paper again since that day. I ate paper again later that day because I forgot how it felt and wanted to re-experience it. Six out of ten would not recommend to a friend, but maybe for the daring. Call of the paper. <laughs> this is the kind of intrusive thought that is more at my speed. Same. Although, you know, I've already put it out there. I've got the darker thoughts. I can't help it. Yeah, you're not so wholesome after all. Maybe none of us are. <laughs> no, but this is that's why this episode is refreshing, right? We yeah. think that we're messed up. I Here I was thinking like, oh no, they have no idea. Right. But, but the truth is, you are not alone. <laughs> We're all full of dark thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> ben Johnson is eating paper, ladies and gentlemen. It's an intrusive thought. I have succumbed to call the boy. Okay, can you read the credits with that paper in your mouth? Or are you going to swallow? Endless Thread is a production of WBUR, Boston's NPR station, in partnership with Reddit. Our show is a dream realized by Jessica Alpert, who, when we ask if she likes the episode we've put together, she says, WTF. Iris Adler is our executive producer, and she makes sure our stories meet the bar of Mildly Interesting. Mix and sound design by John Parati and Paul Vikas, who, whenever we go to record in the field with them, they remind us, Nature is f- lit. 
Our web producer is Megan Kelly, who looks at our attempts at writing web copy and goes, Aww. Michael Pope is our advisor at Reddit, and whenever we try to have a serious meeting with him, he's all, you, I'm a toddler. Our interns are James Lindbergh and Josh Luckins. Our theme music is by Squelcher. Thanks to Redditor Creative Adam for our artwork this week. Creative Adam's Instagram, by the way, is Hi Adam Roberts. On Reddit, we are endless underscore thread. If you want to contribute art for an upcoming episode or give us a juicy story tip so we can tell it like we did today, hit us up there. Quick bit of housekeeping. We are taking some time off from publishing our usual episodes during July. Call it the end of season one. Call it summer vacay. Call it Ben, Josh, and Amory continue to work their butts off on future amazing episodes. Call it what you will. The good news is we'll be dropping some bits and bobs and snacks into the feed so you won't forget about us. Some updates to our favorite episodes, maybe a few other fun experimental things as well. So bear with us while we're tripping through time. Don't go anywhere. We've got more goods coming at you, even while we are in the podcast lab cooking up big things for the fall. We'll be back in August. <laughs> we just oh, a falcon freaking just flew falcon. By. <laughs> a falcon just flew by. Our show is produced by Josh Swartz, also my co-host and producer, Amory Sievertson. I'm senior producer and host, Ben Brock Johnson. I'll let myself out. And just one other note, you know, if there is room on the podcast, um, in case people are, after listening to it, you know, having any um, distressing thoughts, I always like to recommend 1-800-273-TALK which is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 24-7, anonymous, and can get people connected to resources.